Man, so many things to pray about before you come to church. Hand sanitizer, face mask, don't hug too many people. What else? Mark? This is for you. All right, good morning. I feel like there's a little distance between us. Do you feel that? Just a little, little distance. If you have a Bible or a phone or a great memory, go to 1 Peter chapter 2. The teaching team, um, when we were about three, four weeks into this thing, we discussed what would be a great word for the body of Christ to hear during this time. And we came up with 1 Peter because 1 Peter is a small book written by the Apostle Peter during some very challenging times for the body of Christ. Um, just a brief overview, you have, you have the church that had been scattered throughout Asia Minor or modern day Turkey. Uh, these were people that were you know, persecuted, they were harassed, um, they were suffering, uh, they, they were kind of disconnected and displaced people, which is why in 1 Peter they're referred to, the Christians and believers are referred to as pilgrims, sojourners, aliens, strangers in this land, disconnected people. And so Peter comes with not a survival guide, that would be remiss, um, but a, a, a word of empowerment and encouragement and how to live as the people of God and people of substance in the midst of very shaky times that will, that will just you know quake you to the core, that will rattle you. And so we love this book. We love this letter. Uh, we love the fact that it comes from a very imperfect vessel named Peter which you don't have to know a lot about scriptures to know about Peter's history. You know, he was the first disciple called by Jesus. He was the first one picked by Jesus. He was the first one that dropped his nets and said, I'll follow you, and he began to follow him. He's the first one to confess that Jesus Christ is the son of the living God, to which, to which Jesus gave him kudos right there. He's also the first to deny Jesus. He's the first to make all kinds of audacious promises. Even if everybody leaves you, you can count on me, Jesus. And we know, we know the rest of the story. He sold him out quick. He denied him three times. So this is, you know, this is a guy that a lot of us can re relate to. He's the guy that Jesus, you know, you know, says, okay, guys, I need you to pray. I'm going in Gethsemane. I'm going to the cross. I need to, I need to pray. I need you guys to pray. You're my closest people. I need you to pray. And they all sleep. And Peter's amongst that. I mean, just think about this guy, all the promises he made, all the failures he made. You wonder if sometimes Jesus wouldn't just look at him and just go, you know what, Peter, blah, blah, blah. You're a blah, blah, blah disciple. But what's really interesting about these letters right here is that the last, some of the last words that Jesus has for Peter are some really, really tense words. Remember what he said in John chapter 20, 21? He says, you know, Peter, when you were young, you dressed any way you wanted, and you walked any way you wanted. You went wherever you went, wherever you wanted to go, that's where you went. He said, but know this, there's going to come a time when another man is going to outstretch your arms and dress you and take you to a place you don't want to go. And this he spoke of Peter's death. So I want you to think about that. If there was ever a time for Peter to cower and shudder in fear, it would be like, I don't want, I don't want that, I'm out. But the fact that Peter rose up in the power of the Holy Spirit, pens these words, gives us hope. And you remember Peter's response when Jesus told him that. He said, uh, what's going to happen to John? And you know what Jesus said? None of your business. My paraphrase, none of your business. It doesn't matter. You focus on you and me, and we'll get the job done. So, I, you know, I have a lot of respect for this. You know, there's more, there's more written about Peter than all the 11 other disciples combined. So he's got weight. He's got words. He knows how to talk about suffering. He knows how to talk about patience. He knows how to talk about possessing your soul. He knows how to tell people to love in spite of hostility. And that's the, why these are some great words to pay attention to. And so we'll only get through a few verses here, but they're, they're weighty and they're meaty. And they're words that we should really pay t attention to in our times right now. In verse 1 of 1 Peter chapter 2, here's what he says. He says, put away all malice. 
Everybody say malice. He says, put it away. All deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. That's really interesting. That he's the first thing he says, put away all malice. You know what malice is? It's that desire to re retaliate against somebody that hurts you. It's that spirit of retaliation that says, you know what? You did this to me. I'm going to do worse to you, and I'm going to feel good about it. That spirit of retaliation. It's what you see right now going on. Every news channel, that's what you see, a spirit of retaliation. Now, on some fleshly level, retaliation may feel good in the moment, but it's ultimately destructive. I'll share an example with this is. Yesterday, I'm running. Well, waddling. I don't run much, but I waddle. But I was running, and my Achilles tendon started acting up, and I had torn it a few years ago. It started hurting. And I was reminded of a time when I was playing in a soccer game in my early 30s, and I had the ball. I was going to the goal. Nobody in front of me, and a guy from behind me took out my legs. And my first thought was, it's a long game, bro. It's a long game. And I knew right then, I purposed in my heart that at some point in the next 50, 60 minutes, I was going to take him out. Were you a Christian, Pastor Bob? I don't remember the time frame exactly. <laughs> it's a little fuzzy. But you know what? As that game went on, that's all I could think about. I kept my eye on him the whole time. I knew where he was the whole time. And you know what? There came a time when he had the ball and he was going unchallenged to the goal, and I was behind him. So I took him out. I kicked him from behind. He face-planted, and I felt good until I learned that I tore his Achilles tendon. And this was a guy that was a husband, a father. He worked for a living, and I took him out. And so in a moment of malice, I felt good without thinking about the consequences to that. That's what malice is. And Peter says, put it away. Now, it's interesting. Peter is the guy saying, put away all malice and retaliation. Remember, he's the guy that when he, find, he finally woke up from his little prayer, his sleepy time in, in Gethsemane, that he took a guy's ear off with a sword. Do you remember that? What was the guy's name that he took the ear off? Pastor Mark will give you 10 bucks if you know this. Malchus. Mark, you owe about 170 bucks right there because they all got it at the same time. Malchus, think about that. Peter takes off the sword. Whoom, thinks he's doing a good thing. He's retaliating. And he doesn't know what spirit he's of. Even though it felt good in the moment, it seemed right. It seemed pro-Jesus. It was absolutely wrong. It was demonic and diabolical. And now Peter says to the body of Christ, all of us, Put away all malice, the desire to be hostile and hateful and pay back. Put it away. He says, put away all deceit. Deceit is that thing that sneaks up on you during tax season. You know where you just want to budge a little bit, cut a couple corners, inflate some of the numbers, deflate other numbers. You know that little thing to get an advantage against the IRS? Yeah, it's called deceit. It's that you're selling a car and you know something's really wrong with it, but you don't disclose it. You hide it. You conceal it. That's deceitful. And Peter, Peter just says, put away all that. He says all of it. Put away hypocrisy. What's hypocrisy? It's pretense. It's that looking good at all costs. It's showing your best self now. It's not, hypocrisy is not brokenness. Hypo hypocrisy is not when you're struggling with something. It's not an addiction. It, it's, it's not areas of your life that you don't have together. No, it's having all kinds of shipwreck in your life and putting a big old cheesy face on and saying, I'm good. That's a, that's a, there's a gap between what you present, what I present, and how I live. That incongruence is hypocrisy. It's all good. I had people come up to me, just say, you need to pray for our marriage. Rattle off about eight things that are going haywire. Then you see the spouse. Hey, how's it going? Oh, great. 
Well, that's funny because I just talked to your wife and she said all hell's breaking loose in your home. So which is it? See, hypocrisy is something that can be learned. It's something you can train yourself to do. Look good. Spiritual people are some of the most notorious. Look good. Praise Jesus. And all hell's going on. But you don't want anybody to know because you got a reputation to uphold. That's hypocrisy. Better just say, you know what, I'm struggling. Or somebody say, how are you doing? Do you really want to know? Do you have three hours? <laughs> Do you know how to pray? Well, let's have a chat and get real. That's the opposite of hypocrisy. Peter says, put it all away. Put away the mask. What are you trying to impress? You don't need a mask. You don't need a mask. You don't need to jump through hoops for people. You don't have to do things to make people like you. Well, if I show this, then they'll think I'm... No, forget all. Scrap it. Be real. Be you. Be transparent. The good, bad, and ugly. Peter says, put it all away. Put it away. Put away envy. Did I tell you this wasn't a real feel-good message for the lawn? Did I tell you that yet? I, you know, I'm just telling you a few words here. Thank you. Put away envy. You know what envy is? You're mad about the success of somebody else. <laughs> you hear somebody, I got blessed. I got a $2,000 raise. And you start, Ugh. I don't think they deserve that. And you start resenting their blessing. In fact, you, you hope they don't get blessed. You want what they have. You resent people for having things, whatever it is. It can happen with spiritual gifts. Somebody has a spiritual gift. You say, oh, I want that. They don't deserve it. I know them. Da, 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 da. Right? Envy. You know what envy is? It's a manifestation of the true discontentedness in your heart. If I'm content, I hope you all get blessed. Whatever that means to God. I do. I rejoice with you. I celebrate. I wouldn't go, oh, man I, man, I know that person. They shouldn't get God. Do you know what you're doing there? No, envy. Put it away. And then all slander. He's talking to the church. He, he's not talking to pagans. He's not talking to heathens. He's talking to the church. Put away all slander. Now, why would these things be present? Well, if you're an oppressed people, if you're scattered and you don't have real homes, and you're just like, wow, I'm just trying to follow Jesus, there's going to be a temptation for you to have malicious intent in your heart for people who are treating you wrong. And, 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 and just to even survive, you may have to be deceitful. Where you're trying to show your, the best part of yourself, your envy of what's going on around you, and then you're slanderous. You say things to hurt another's reputation. It's actually a, a, a speaking down about people. And it usually starts with a little phrase like, well, I heard. Well, did you hear? You know that whole thing? Make no mistake, there's a spirit behind every one of these things that I'm reading right here. It's not just natural thinking. There's demonic hosts of hell that baptized those words right there. And Peter's saying, get rid of it. Have you noticed the fruit of the Spirit is not exactly blooming on Facebook these days? I mean, have you, I, mean I, I don't know. Uh, I have seen people cannibalize one another on Facebook because they disagree. And it goes boom. Boom, boom, and then they up it and they up it. And I'm like a spectator. Where's the popcorn? I'm watching people cannibalize each other. No, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, it, it's demonic. I see family members going at each other's throat in full display. Are you kidding me? There was one I watched. This thread, man, was a mile long, and it kept going. And it kept going. I kept looking. I'm watching this, and I'm getting, you know what I'm getting ready to say? I'm ready to jump in and say, can I come to your house at Thanksgiving? <laughs> but that was demonic also, so I just scrapped that. <laughs> you, know, at, you know, before you talk about people, ask yourself some questions. Is it true? 
what's being said, is it true? Is it loving? Is it necessary? Do I need to say it? There's times I was ready to launch on social media. You know what? It's not necessary. I love to fight, not as much as I used to, but you know what? Have your day in the sun. No, I'm out. Ask yourself that. Ask yourself, does it build somebody up or does it tear somebody down? And if it doesn't build up, get rid of it. Scrap it. You don't need it. They don't need it. Remember, he's talking, you're born again. You have a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus. You have an inheritance. He's talking, no, get back to who you really are. And then verse 2, here's the feel good. Okay, here we go. Like newborn babies, long for, desire for, and crave the pure spiritual milk of the word of God. So that it might, you may grow up into salvation if indeed that you have tasted that the Lord is good. How many of you have tasted the Lord is good? Can I see your hands? You've tasted that. And he says, keep longing for, keep desiring. You know, we got babies over here. We got Vlad over here. He's got his little girl, Grace, over there. Look at her, little cute little girl. Got my grandson back there somewhere. Lennon, Lennon Robert, right there, buddy. Cute. The only thing he does, eat, sleep, poop, repeat. That's it. That's all he does. And he's eating all the time. He's just like, <laughs> it's like, you got, I, no, I said to him, you got to calm down, man. It's like, you get that bottle. I'm just watching it go down. Now, you know, there's got to be a different way. Two months old, I made him a peanut butter jelly sandwich. He's on solids. You're welcome. Character and conviction facilitate spiritual formation. Verse 1, those words we just mentioned, spoil your appetite for verse 2. If malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander is a part of your life, I guarantee you're not going to be excited about desiring the sincere, pure, unadulterated milk of the word of God. And don't just read the word, church. Read the word and invite the word to read you. Yeah. Fall in love with conviction. Make besties out of conviction. Read the word, and when you go, ouch, say, that was a good thing right there. Because it's all that's happening right there is that is a transformational moment where your heart is being squeezed by the Spirit of God to look more like Jesus and less like the world. And that's a good thing. We're either being conformed to Jesus or deformed by the world. That's just the truth. I'll just tell you this right now. Every single day, you and I are being discipled by either the world or by the Word. Popular opinion, people's opinion, or scripture? Philosophies of the culture, or prayer? Peter, man, I mean, I, I love this. I hope you love it. I love it. We're being discipled. 1 John chapter 2, verse 16. All that's in the world. Notice the word all is all over the place. All that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not from the Father. It's from the world. How's your discipleship looking these days? Lust of the flesh, slaves to pleasure, the domination of the sentence, senses, that if it feels good, do it can be gluttony, can be anger. It can be the idol of happiness. 
Well, I'm not going to do anything unless it makes me feel happy. Well, you just got discipled by the world. I don't want any inconvenience. I just want everything to feel good. I don't want to be ruffled. Wrong planet, kids. Wrong planet. I'm serious. Lust of the eyes. If I see it, I want it, I got to have it. Pride of life. Arrogant spirit of self-sufficiency. Egotism. Look at me. Applaud me. It's all about me. And now we have mediums where you can airbrush your life every single day. You can look good and get a clap clap. Thumbs up and you're awesome. Feed your ego. I must be something. There's a few people that like me. It's garbage. Junk food. It's the discipleship of junk food. Okay, Jesus loves you very much. What time is it? Ha, we got 45 minutes. Um, verse 9, 1 Peter 2. Oh, I'm kidding. Calm down. This is what, I mean, once again, you skip a few verses, and if you go online, you'll see Mike Breen talked last week about your, your personal gospel. So I'm just, it was awesome. Just going to jump down to verse 9. And this is really, you know, just own this. Take this home. You are a chosen generation. A royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into marvelous light, who once were not a people, but now are the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now you have obtained mercy. Seven times in five chapters, Peter reminds us, you've been chosen, you've been handpicked by God. You've been adopted. That's the main event right there. And so people who understand that, their life has changed. They don't participate in that other nonsense. This is the language. That verse right there, 9 and 10, is the language of Exodus 6. It's a parallel to Exodus 6. Remember what God told the children of Israel. Moses, tell them, I am the Lord. I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from slaves to them. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm. And with mighty acts of judgment, I will take you as my own people. And I will be your God. And you will know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. Those two parallel verses are all about identity. It's the language of belonging. It's the language of family. It's the language of purpose. It's the language of future, of adoption, of deliverance. And that's what God wants for us. What's true about your inheritance is also true about your identity. Remember, we talked last time. That your inheritance is imperishable, undefiled, pure, kept, and never changes. Your identity, my identity, is the meaning and the life that suffering can't take away. That's the main event right there. You and I are the people of God and nothing can touch it. Untouchable. Get a tattoo. Untouchable. It's my identity. Let's stand up together. You know, there's, there's a sense, and you'll hear people a lot of times use this language. They'll say things like, gosh, I just don't feel like I fit in. Let me just say, if what Peter is writing, that we're all pilgrims, strangers, aliens, sojourners, there is going to be a sense that you and I don't fit in anywhere. And that's okay, because where we do fit, is heaven. Where we do fit is in God's heart. Where we do fit is in the eternal purposes of God. That is the main event for us. So if you kind of feel like, wow, nothing seems to be working, nothing seems to, I just don't fit, I always feel like disconnecting. Yeah, you have, like I, a longing to belong. We do. 
and we're wired by God for that. But it's belonging to him first. And then all this, it's other stuff. So I'm going to pray. I'm going to have Aaron Dolce come on up here, and we're going to pray. So, you know, as you, as you think about some of the things I mentioned, some of the things that you've seen, the news, different things, I mean, you just think about the turmoil and um, the groaning that's going on and the grieving that's going on. And I personally believe that it's gonna take a move of God it's going to take the people of God to be the people of God in times like this for any real change, not cosmetic change, but real change that has to start in the heart. Yeah, you can reform, you can, you can make laws, pass laws, and those are all good. But unless the heart changes, I don't have a lot of hope. So Aaron, I'm going to have you start out and I'll finish Father, I am reminded where your word says that you come at times to shake things that can be shaken so that you can strengthen what remains, God. Father, I ask that we would not waste a time of shaking by trying to return to the way things always were before, God. That we would recognize that the discomfort that we feel, that we would recognize that all the pain that we're seeing isn't something new, but that it's something that was actually bubbling underneath the surface that was always there that you're actually revealing, God. So Father, I ask for your healing to touch our nation. Jesus, I'm standing with you in faith, believing that you've only seen ripe harvest fields, God. You have only seen a ripe harvest field, Jesus. You are not looking at our nation in despair. You are not looking at our nation saying, what am I gonna do? But you have full faith that you can redeem, that you can restore, and that you can reconcile, Jesus. So, Father, we pray that you would rain down peace and justice on our nation, God. That you would set things right, Father. In Jesus' name, we're believing you in our lifetimes, God, that we would see the goodness of God in the land of the living. Lord, we choose to not let our circumstances dictate our perspective. Jesus, would you teach us what you see? Would you teach us by your spirit how to feel about what's going on, Lord? Father, I pray for protection over our first responders. I pray for protection over everybody who's out there getting caught up in all the craziness, Lord. Father, reconciliation that it would hit our land, Jesus. And Father, that we, your people, would recognize that we have an opportunity here. Jesus, you are moving on the earth right now. In the midst of a crisis that the enemy would try to make us freak out, you are moving on the earth, God. So, Father, I ask that we would be ready for that. Jesus, that we would let the words spoken today and that you're speaking to us across the season go deep, that you would transform us, Holy Spirit. God, that you would remove everything that we've propped ourselves up on aside from you. We trust you, God, in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. In that verse one where he said, put away those things that I mentioned it literally means to denounce them denounce them so father we do denounce the malice in our heart the deceit in our heart the hypocrisy in our heart the envy in our heart the slander in our heart God, for people that have been on the receiving end of that, I pray that they would experience healing. God, we denounce injustice. We denounce racism in the name of Jesus. Thank you that we are one family under God, one people under God. So I pray for healing, God. Lord, your word says that in last days, 
because iniquity increases, the love of many will get cold. So I pray that no heart in here would grow cold. They would be fully alive, fully loving. We denounce the spirit of hate and division. We denounce murder and violence. Lawlessness, we denounce. God, we pray that you would make things right for the families of George Floyd, Namad Aubrey, Brianna Taylor, many other people, African Americans, God, that have suffered from injustice. We pray for healing in that community. We pray for law enforcement right now, God. People are being retaliated against, killed. All these people represent families who are going through brokenness, and we pray that only the Spirit of God would come and bring healing and mending. God, help us have a revelation of what it means to be the people of God. Heal our hearts, change our hearts, transform our lives as only you can so that we can be the salt and the light you've called us to be in times like these. In the name and the authority of Jesus Christ, I bless every person here, God. I pray that they would feel like they belong to you. They would sense your presence. Those that need deliverance would be set free. We thank you for adopting us, God. And we thank you that we have your future. In the name of Jesus, everybody said, Amen. Don't hug anybody. Don't hug anybody. Just leave, go to your car, and go home. No, I'm kidding. Air hugs, air elbows, high fives. Love you, church. See ya.